Okie dokes, we're live, go. Fantastic. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here and giving up your time to join us for the first virtual talk of the Stellenbosch University Surgical Society. We know we have a lot of medical students in the audience, a couple of doctors, we have some BSc students, some honors students, okay. uh, physios, allies. Thank you so much for all of you who signed up. Um, so I did mention this in the email that went out yesterday, but just to quickly touch on it again, some in-house rules. So you'll see that on the left bottom of your screen, there's a little mic. You are all muted as a upon arrival onto the platform and we ask that you please just keep it that way um, in order to avoid any background noise and to make it as pleasant as possible for everyone then you'll also see down at your toolbar there's a little chat function and if you click on there you can send a private message to Dr Chanel so anytime throughout the presentation if you have a question you can just pop that through to her and then she'll answer that at the end of the presentation um, so I'm sure a lot of you or most of you know who Dr. Chanel Changford is. She's a surgical consultant at Tigerberg Hospital um, and I'm just going to give over to her so she can give a more thorough introduction. Awesome. Um, thank you everybody for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. I'm very excited about this thing that um, the SAS has launched. We're trying to do kind of online content and we're figuring out how to make it useful and interactive for you guys because I know there's a lot of content online but to actually bring it home in a way that you guys can use and that's applicable to your exams and your practice I think that is um, sometimes lacking so this is one of the first um, online classes we're doing and again it's for you guys so it needs to be useful for you all of the information I've taken is available from your tutorials on Sunlearn but again, if there's anything, please just um, write a message and we'll address all of that at the end of the discussion. And it's very important to me that this is a discussion. It's not just a one way thing of me throwing information at you. You guys can read that in any textbook. So again, keep it interactive. But, you know, I'm going to try and make it lighthearted and fun. So grab a cup of coffee. Pants are not compulsory for this. And um, yeah, shall we get started? Okay, so direct your attention to the PowerPoint. Okay, so we're going to have a quick review of CRUSH. Most of this will be in the trauma setting, but the basic condition and management is the same regardless of um, how you will actually practice. Okay, so how we're going to discuss this topic, we're going to go into what it is, why it happens, and how um, the issues that we're seeing are actually happening. And then the useful stuff, what you as one of the, I don't want to say first responders, um, first practitioners should actually do or should initiate. And then any other questions you guys have related to this or anything that we may touch on during the topic. Okay, everybody happy with that? Right, so now we're starting with what? Um, so our basic definition. So we throw the term crush around a lot, okay? But there is a difference between crush injury, crush syndrome, compartment syndrome, which is kind of related, they're cousins, but not the same thing, and reperfusion syndrome. So to understand what we're talking about, I think we should just spend a couple of minutes on that. Okay, so crush injury, this can happen to anybody in any scenario. So this is an injury of the tissue that causes breakdown of the muscle cells. So if you had a hard job this afternoon, you may have crash injury. If you have a fat girlfriend that rolled over, you may have crash injury. But this is not going to get exciting for us because we're not talking about crash syndrome. That is the type of thing we see in the hospital. So crash injury doesn't really tell us anything except that there was muscle injury. Okay. So now when we speak about crash syndrome, remember a syndrome, the term, means that there is a couple of signs and symptoms related to it okay so it's a constellation of things that form that syndrome you may have some of it you may have all of it um, that's not really important but if you have multiple features of crash injury it becomes the syndrome okay so again it's a group of symptoms caused by rhabdo rhabdomyolysis just basically means lysis breakdown of muscle okay 
So the triad that is usually described, we don't often see all three together, is the muscle weakness, muscle pain, and the dark urine. Okay. By the time you're seeing dark urine, you are already quite worried. Okay. And then, of course, the things that um, the clinical features of that is your ECG changes, your renal issues, which we're going to go into more detail with, and the electrolyte abnormality. Okay. So the muscle weakness, all of that is signs we're going to see, ECG changes, that is what we're going to look for. Okay. Muscle weakness is not something we really see a lot, but obviously if you've been beaten or injured, those muscles are going to be tender just from the injury. Okay. Now compartment syndrome, which can, interestingly enough, cause crush, but also be caused by crush. Okay. So we can go into a little bit more detail with that later. What is compartment syndrome? Not the same thing as crush syndrome. Okay. So increase in a compartment pressure. Okay, but that is just one thing. Remember, we said we have to see a couple of signs and symptoms for it to be a syndrome. So it is an increase in the pressure in a closed compartment. Remember, I'm not saying what compartment. There are a couple of compartments in the body. Okay, that affects the perfusion. And because of the perfusion being affected, we see weakness, we see pain, we see pallor, and all of those other things that we understand from compartment syndrome. Okay, so everybody following with me up to this point. Right, then reperfusion syndrome. All of these things are very closely related. That's why I decided to put them together. So reperfusion is the signs and symptoms that you see when you put blood back into a limb or an area that didn't have it before. Okay, so it is when you open the compartment or when you fix the blood vessel. Okay when all of that gunk goes flooding back into the system, then you are going to see your reperfusion, which is going to look very, very similar to your crush syndrome. Okay, so those things are very similar, but it depends on what the original cause of the ischemic issue was. Okay, again, we can go into that a bit later. Let's just get our basics. In. Okay, so now what is going to um, injure these muscle cells. Why are we seeing a crush syndrome? So there are a couple of headings that you can define it under, and that is direct trauma. So in the South African setting, normally I like you guys to give me a couple of examples, but it's difficult now. So in the South African setting, classically your community assault, your shambok syndrome, okay? But any major beating, any major trauma to the muscle. So if you fall off a mountain, if you are in a car accident, if you are trapped under a building that collapsed, um, if you have multiple broken limbs, okay, that is examples of direct trauma. If you had a very hard exercise session, if you ran a marathon, if you had a forced march, those are also examples of um, direct exertional injury to the muscle. Uh, what other stuff did I come up with? Burns, again, direct trauma. Electrocution, direct trauma. Not necessarily that you will see the injury immediately, but with the route that that current passed through, okay? All of that muscle is injured by the current. Um, seizure, something we forget about. That is major muscle exertion, even though it's involuntary. Um, tissue ischemia, I think we've touched on. So if there's vascular injury or compartment syndromes of a limb because of bandaging, um, immobility, and this is not long-term immobility. This is you passed out drunk and fell asleep on your arm um, or a patient was found lying by the side of the road. You know, lying on a major, major muscle compartment does affect um, blood supply to that compartment. Okay, so drugs and toxins. This can be drugs that the patient takes or it can actually even be stuff that we give. So classically described with statins, but also your inhalational drugs, steroids can cause it, cocaine, ecstasy, LSD. There's really a whole list of drugs, but it is one of the rarer things we see except with the statin. So um, not something you will commonly think about unless you are seeing a patient that has no um, 
clinical history that normally fits in with our trauma crashes. And then spider bites, snake bites, depending on what kind it is, um, can cause quite a severe cytotoxic reaction um, with muscle breakdown. Um, yes, mentioned that. And then metabolic stuff, so some of your weirder viral conditions, endocrine conditions like hypothyroidism can cause it, hypothermia like um, your malignant hypothermias or just severe infection, and then electrolyte issues, um, which we're going to touch on a little bit later, but basically um, where the balance isn't correct and the cell actually breaks down because its membrane stability isn't maintained. Okay, but mostly we see crush with trauma and injury. So if you are seeing the usual clinical picture of crash, but you know this patient wasn't assaulted, then you need to kind of look at your weirder causes of crash. All right. All right. So again, vehicle entrapment, MBAs, major force, especially if you get the history from your EMS that they struggle to get the patient out of the vehicle. Um, that picture is of Schambock syndrome, the classic tram track that we always speak about. Um, earthquakes, building collapses, mining accidents we need to think about. Okay, um, on the left of the screen is snake bites and envenomation. Um, the picture in the middle is electrocution. So don't be reassured by a small little burn patch. That is just where the current went in. Okay, it's all of the muscle bulk and nerve injury that the current traverses that is actually the real injury. Um, marathons, we see it um, even in fit athletes, you know, they're dehydrated, um, they're sweating, they're not keeping up with their fluid losses. Even if you're fit, you still have muscle injury with exercise that you do. So marathon runners, like we said, um, people who are trapped in the environment in deserts and whatever. And then ravers and illicit drug users, you know, they're dehydrated, they're dancing all night. It's exertion, there's a couple of factors that contribute um, on top of the drug intake. Okay, so we now understand what causes it, but to really understand what we're seeing, I think it's very important to have a grasp of what is happening in the muscle. Because if you understand what is happening, you understand why you see things and what you particularly need to look for in these patients. Okay, so don't be scared by this picture. I'm going to talk you through it. This is a normal muscle cell. So the red tube coming in, that is your artery. Blue tube going in, that is your vein. And of course, the, next, the connections in between it is your capillaries. Because remember, everything doesn't diffuse directly from the vessels. It goes to your thin walled capillaries, okay, that are one cell thick because then things can go in and out. Okay, the blood vessels, their walls are too thick for things to diffuse out. Okay, so the little green multiple arrows, that is your capillary bed. Okay, the orange cell, that is your muscle cell. So what I'm showing you there is what electrolytes live on the inside of the cell. Okay, and what electrolytes live on the outside. Okay, now the body is all about balance. So what keeps some things on the inside of the cell and some things on the outside? Because the body will always try and, through diffusion, create balance, okay? And that is the little yellow arrows that you can see. That is your pumps, okay? So those pumps work against the gradient. It keeps the potassium on the inside and the sodium on the outside. And anything that goes against balance uses energy. So those are energy-dependent pumps that maintain the balance, all right? The little complicated pictures that you can see in the blood vessels, that is hemoglobin. You see it has a um, kind of a four-point structure, right? That sounds vaguely familiar from like second-year physiology, right? Nod or pretend to nod, all right? Vaguely familiar, all right? Now, you see there's something that looks almost like hemoglobin, but isn't hemoglobin, that lives in the muscle cell, all right? And what is that? That is your myoglobin, okay? Similar function to hemoglobin, partially similar structure. It's about one quarter of a hemoglobin mo um, molecule, but it looks similar. All right, so that is what I'm showing you there. So myoglobin lives in the myocyte, in the muscle cell. All right. 
and also has oxygen um, carrying capacity to the muscle cell. So you understand what's happening in this picture. It's just blood flow going past it. It's your muscle cell. What lives on the inside? What lives on the outside? So let's just have a quick look at what lives on the inside of the muscle cell. So your potassium, okay, your phosphate, your LDH, and your CK. So that is CKMM. Remember, there are three types of CK. Okay, the brain, the MB, which is cardiac, and the MM, which is muscle. Okay, so BB, MB, MM. So uh, it's creat uh, creatinine kinase. Am I right? Yes. Okay, so that just has to do with um, energy usage in the muscle cell. You don't need to know the detail of that. We are not physiologists. We are medics. Okay. So that is a normal little muscle cell. It's happy. If you squish it, okay, it's going to break open and those things are going to leak out. That is relatively obvious. But if you have a vascular insult, okay, be it, it's normally on the arterial side, that's where we see it, then what is the issue going to be? It's not that the cell is injured, okay, but it's that those little yellow pumps that maintain the normal balance and health of that cell and the electrolyte balance across the membrane, they are not going to have enough energy to do their job. Okay, so that is the mechanism of vascular injury and compartment syndrome damaging muscle cells. Okay, on top of there actually being an increase in pressure that also damages the muscle cells. So that is a dual mechanism with compartment syndrome, but we can discuss that a little bit later. Let's not get distracted. So for a muscle cell to be healthy, that balance must be maintained. It mustn't be squished by any trauma, and its pumps must be functional. For those pumps to be functional, they need energy. All right. So now we move on. Okay, so now we've said that the cell is damaged through whatever mechanism, and all of that intracellular stuff leaks out. Okay. So yes, we need those things in our body, but we need them in a contained, protected um, environment, okay? So if all of that stuff suddenly floods the system, what are we going to have? We're going to have cardiac issues and we're going to have renal issues. So this is the major manifestation of crush syndrome. So what issues do we have um, in the cardiac, cardiovascular environment, okay? We have all of that potassium rushing into the blood system. Okay, and as well as, let's just have a look back there, okay, phosphate as well, and calcium that was on the outside of the cell now being um, kind of bound into this injured cell, okay, so it isn't as available in the extracellular tissue as what it should be. So we said cardiac issues, we're going to see an increase in potassium because it's leaking out of the cell, we're going to see a decrease in calcium because it's being bound into that injured muscle area. And that gives us the dysrhythmias that we see. Yes. Um, can I ask you to just type a message? Uh, what's, what's the issue? Just type me a message. I'm just seeing one of our colleagues are having an issue here. Uh, Speak to me, what's the issue? Yeah? Something wrong? Uh, let's have a look here, sorry for that guys. Not seeing any message here. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> all right, okay, so uh, where was I? Okay, so all of the stuff that's in the cell flooding out, and obviously potassium in the heart, the heart is very sensitive to that. And calcium that would normally protect the heart from any electrolyte issues. Remember calcium is a membrane stabilizer, okay? That's not dropping because it's being bound into that injured muscle. So that is why we have our dysrhythmias, all right? So the biggest danger is when you have that first injury because they need to have all of that potassium. But if you have injured muscle, you can have persistent leak, which is something why, uh, which is why we need to keep an eye on potassium levels. And then, of course, if there's injury, there's edema. That is just the body's reaction. 
So there's also a lot of fluid sequestration in that injured muscle. Okay, so volume drops, which is why we see blood pressure drop. Okay, now the renal issues, and this is the major manifestation of crash, um, and we need to understand what we're seeing and why. Okay, so where we going now? Okay. So first of all, we said myoglobin that was intracellular is now floating around, okay? And myoglobin is directly toxic to the glomerulus, okay? So even though it is a native molecule in high concentration, directly toxic. So that is the one thing, okay? In an acidic environment, there are naturally occurring proteins called TAM horsefall proteins, your TH proteins that are found in the um, kidney. So in an acidic environment, the myoglobin joins with those proteins and it forms um, concretions, like concrete casts that blocks up the kidney tubules. And you know the kidney is basically just a very complicated set of tubules. Okay, so if those tubules are blocked, you don't get good flow. If there's not good flow in the kidney, you get ATM because it becomes ischemic. It is dependent on that flow to be perfused. Okay, so direct injury, it forms casts, which blocks up the tubules. Okay, there's oxidative stress from toxins that are also released from that injured muscle. Okay, because of the hypovolemia, because of the fluid sequestration, we have our native RAS system activated. So it further vasoconstricts and further hyperperfuses our kidney. Okay. So remember, the body is trying to do this to help itself, but unfortunately, it injures itself in the process. Okay. Again, the hypovolemia, which affects the perfusion of the kidney, further worsens um, its ischemic picture. And the ATN, like we mentioned, because all of those tubes are blocked up, you don't get good flow. So that further injures the kidney. So... It's, it's quite a couple of things, but it makes sense if you understand why things are happening. Okay, so that'll be like a great surgical question, and I know you guys are going to ace it because you understand it now. Okay, so now understanding what is happening in the body, we need to think about what we can do about it. All right, so this is where we come in. We cannot unbreak the muscle. Okay, so now we have to deal with all of that stuff floating around in the system. So ideally, you want to initiate fluids as early as possible. So um, where you have trained EMS for that, remember not all of our um, EMS staff are allowed to give IV fluid. You want to get a drip up and you want to start giving fluids as early as possible, preferably before extrication, before they get the patient out, because you want to have them um, pre-volume loaded. Okay, pre-diluted before you get them out from under the building or get them out of the car and all of that gunk immediately hits their system. Okay, again, remember these are trauma patients, so you always start with your ABC. All right, and then fluids. Fluids, fluids, fluids are the mainstay of management. So you want to initiate saline at about 250 moles per hour. Okay, so... This is quite a large amount. You'll see it's more than your maintenance value, okay? But this is just your starting number. So you are going to see how your patient's doing, what else they have going on, and you're going to titrate this to urine output. So these patients can be quite labor intensive because hour by hour, you're gonna go up or down with their fluids according to what you see in the clinical picture and urine output. What are we aiming for? We're aiming for at least two moles per kilogram per hour. So this is more than the average trauma patient where we only aim for one mole per, per kilogram because we are trying to dilute them and flush the kidney. Okay, so we know that if we are getting two moles per kilogram, we really are flushing that kidney out. All right, and then we want to manage the cause. If the cause was a car accident, they're out of the car, that's fine. If the cause was a building that fell on them or a beating, they are out of that situation. But if you have a compartment syndrome, you need to manage that. If you have a vascular injury um, or something impairing circulation, 
you need to manage that. Otherwise, you are going to have persistent muscle injury and persistent leak of these intracellular contents into the system. All right, so now there's a couple of other stuff that's mentioned in the literature, and um, I think you guys often feel that just fluid is a bit boring, you want to do more. Unfortunately, there is nothing else that is actually proven to improve outcome. Okay, so alkalinizing the urine, why do we think that might work? Remember, we said one of the major problems is the precipitation with the proteins in the kidney, the TAM phosphor protein. Now, this is particularly bad if it is in an acidic environment. So we think that by making the urine more alkaline, we'll have less precipitation. Yes, theoretically it makes sense, but it is actually quite difficult because part of the kidney's function is acid-base um, regulation. So it kind of works against us for alkalinizing the urine. It's difficult to do. It needs to be done in an ICU setting. And we haven't really been able to prove that our patients do better with all of this extra PT that we put in. So it's a nice idea, but we haven't really gotten it to help the patient. So don't stress about it. Okay, forced diuresis. So this is where you're giving the patient diuretics to kind of force the kidney to work. The thing is you have a functional kidney. So by whipping a kidney that's already injured, you're not helping it. If you are not getting your urine output, you're either not giving enough volume or the kidney is already injured and it cannot create and excrete urine. Okay, so by forcing it with drugs that have hypotensive effect, that have electrolyte effect, you could be actually compromising the patient um, and not getting what you want. So yes, we want to flush the kidney, but if the kidney is already, already injured, it's not going to flush. All right. So if you're not getting your urine output, you're thinking, am I giving enough volume? Are they still volume behind? Or is this kidney already injured and I've missed the boat a little bit? Okay, so forcing the kidney to work with diuretics, not a good idea. Okay, then dialysis. Um, dialysis has specific indications, okay? And that is only once renal injury has actually already occurred, okay? Dialysis is not kidney friendly. So if you see a patient where you suspect crush, plugging them into a dialysis machine from the beginning um, is not necessarily going to protect the kidney from injury, okay? It means the injury has already occurred. So you um, need to institute your first line management and if you have renal failure, then bring dialysis in. There is no room for primary dialysis, if I can put it like that, okay? So dialysis has specific indications. Um, if you want to know about that, we can discuss it afterwards, but just diagnosing a crush injury or a crush syndrome is not an immediate indication for dialysis. All right, so then I thought this was a very good question. Um, in crush, injury um, or, or very injured limbs, when do we think about amputation? When do we think about fixing the limb? So um, we need to look at, is the limb salvageable? Okay, and crush syndrome on its own will not immediately make us think, okay, let's amputate and get rid of the problem. Okay, um, the injury has already happened. Getting rid of that injured leg um, is not going to uncrush the patient. All of those intracellular contents have already spilled into the system. So getting rid of an injured leg um, or injured muscle tissue is not going to solve our problem. Um, when we speak to our orthopedic guys, we do a mangled extremity severity score. So it's not just about how bad the leg looks, okay? These days with um, ICU care and vascular and all of that, you can save almost any leg, but you need to consider what is the condition of the patient, what is the functionality of that limb going to be. To have a useless leg still attached to your body um, sometimes impairs the quality of life of the patient more. Um, so that again is, a, is 
actually a whole topic on its own. But um, on your guys' level, that's not a decision you will have to make. It is always a group decision. Um, you just manage the crush as is and try and splint and, and get that in as aligned a way as possible. But the primary management of crush does not change. Getting rid of the injured limb does not um, affect their crush syndrome. Okay. All right. So that is basically crush in a in a very quick nutshell. All right. So if you guys need more detail, I'm happy to provide that. Give me questions. And then I want to say thank you to those of you that submitted questions online. I could see there was a lot of insight to it. So thank you for that. All of the questions were really good. Remember, there is no stupid question. Okay. Um, if you ask a question, you maybe feel stupid for five seconds. If you don't ask a question, you're going to be stupid for the rest of your life. Okay. So a couple of questions. Um, I just made a short summary. Uh, someone asked, should first responders initiate fluid? And I think like we've covered, that is definitely a good idea. Um, we don't always have people that can put up lines, but if you are in the periphery or arrive at an accident scene, definitely um, judiciously, we don't want to flood patients, but starting fluids is a good idea. Okay. Someone asked about the primary management. So it isn't very exciting, unfortunately. It is about recognizing that this patient could have a crash. Remember, we don't always have the blood results available immediately. But recognizing that this patient could have a crash injury, their history fits in with it, they may already be showing clinical signs or not, start your crash management. Okay, and what is that? That is fluid and urine output monitoring. Okay, nothing more exciting than that. Okay. Dialysis we discussed. Um, someone asked about when reperfusion becomes an issue. Um, is it the amount of time from the incident or from the removal of the object? So it is, in my mind, from when the object is removed or when the patient is freed because the crushed tissue, all of those contents are contained until you release that pressure and then they can flood into the system. So you would think usually from the removal of the object or from the time they are freed, but it, it doesn't really particularly make a difference, um, you know, when, when the potassium hit their system exactly. It depends on what you're seeing when they are lying in the bed in front of you. Okay. But, but good to think about, you know, how long they were in traps, um, how long they were dehydrating. Okay. Um, so someone else asked crush injury versus crush syndrome. Um, I think we have discussed those definitions. So a crush injury means the muscle is injured. A crush syndrome means they are manifesting issues from that muscle injury. Okay, management, and then when we fix the leg versus amputating the leg. All right, so I hope I've covered that for you now. Let me just access this chat thingy and see what questions we've had come up. Okay, so, um, okay, so someone asked, is it the potassium or the sodium that's a membrane stabilizer? So remember, sodium lives on the outside of the cell in the extracellular fluid. The potassium stays on the inside, okay? So that electrolyte difference is what creates the electrical membrane potential all right and the body likes that to be at a certain level and what maintains that is the um the sodium potassium pump which is energy dependent okay so them staying on the correct side of the membrane okay that creates a um, potential and is actually what makes the membrane unstable if i can put it like that because there is an electrical potential difference, that is what makes that membrane um, triggerable. I know that's not a word, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. That's what, um, yes, what, what makes that there, that it can be triggered by a nerve impulse. So what stabilizes the membrane is the calcium, okay? So what that does is it brings down the um, potential difference between the inside and the outside. 
and that means the membrane is less sensitive to being triggered. Okay, so when we do a potassium shift, where what we're actually doing with the potassium when the levels are high is we are trying to move it from the intravascular space where we are testing it because remember we're testing it in the blood okay so i wonder if we just go maybe go back to that picture of what a normal cell looks like okay so remember when we when we test the blood then we have a high potassium so that means it is in the red or in the blue pipe all right but it should actually be intracellular so what do we want to do when we do a potassium shift we want to move the potassium from the blood extracellularly where it is. We want to move it back into the cell. Okay. So how do we do that? We use insulin and dextrose. Okay. So what is it that is actually causing the potassium to shift? It's the insulin. Okay. So if they have a high sugar, you don't need to give them dextrose with it. It's the insulin that you're giving that causes the potassium to shift back into the cell. But we always give calcium beforehand because it is a membrane stabilizer. So what that means is remember, if you have electrolytes moving across a cell, that affects the, elect uh, the electrical potential. Okay. And if you have a high electrical potential, that means that it's a very sensitive cell. Any little thing is going to trigger it. Okay, and when we have that in our cardiac muscle, we don't want a sensitive cardiac muscle because that is where you get your dysrhythmia. That is why the high potassiums make you more prone to dysrhythmia because that electro um, potential of the cardiac muscle is higher than what it should be. All right, um, so we give the calcium to bring that potential down a little bit, which means you need more trigger for depolarization of that cell. So it is less sensitive to being triggered. Okay, so that is why potassium and calcium is so important with these dysrhythmias. Okay. Um, all right, so we're happy with membrane stabilization, why we give the calcium, um, and why it's important that the electrolytes stay on the correct side of the membrane. Okay, so here's a very good clinical question. Heart failure patients. Okay, so why is that an issue? Because they have a pump that can't handle the extra volume that we are giving them. All right. They are definitely more challenging. Um, but remember, they still have the trauma. They may still be hypovolemic. Okay. But yes, you are definitely going to be way more careful with how much fluid you're giving them. Remember, 250 is a thumb suck number all right so with those patients maybe you start at 200 maybe you start at 150 180 okay but those patients you're going to have to watch a lot more closely and you may do half an hour urine output checks okay um or start them at 250 but bring their volumes down within half an hour or start low and bring their volumes up i can't give you a hundred percent foolproof plan but it's good that you're thinking about it because those patients are definitely going to be more volume sensitive. So if it was me, I would maybe start at a lower volume and check the urine output and rather go up because with those patients, it's difficult to get the fluid out once you've put it in. So rather start a little bit lower and titrate up with your urine output, okay? Then have them overtly fluid overloading very quickly. Um, the thing with these patients is, remember, they may be on diuretics beforehand, okay? So they should have taken their drugs that morning, but they may actually need like a little smidgen of diuretic to encourage their kidney because they already have desensitized kidney, okay? But that is something you discuss with your senior or with your referral hospital or with um, your physician or whoever, okay? You guys are in charge of immediate stabilization, recognition, stabilization, but with a patient like that, they will most likely need transfer because they have trauma with comorbidity. So it's not just a run of the mill contribution. Um, okay, so dialysis indication. Okay, a little bit out of the scope, but dialysis, like we said, is not 
renal friendly. Okay, so you don't actually help the kidney. Okay, the kidney does not like dialysis. You are trying to keep the patient alive until their kidney recovers. Dialysis doesn't help the kidney recover. The kidney needs to recover or not on its own. Okay, so we are just trying to keep the patient alive until the kidney recovers. So indications for dialysis is a potassium that you cannot keep low. Okay, so you will do repeated shifts and a couple of tricks to get rid of the potassium. Okay, but if the potassium is remaining high despite shifts, so that is a refractory hyperkalemia. Okay, and you normally only shift potassium when they are above six. So you keep shifting and shifting and giving drugs and whatever, and you're not getting that potassium below six. Okay, or you are shifting and there's ECG changes anyway. That means the heart is more, more sensitive. Okay. <clears throat> A refractory acidosis. Remember, the kidney is also in charge of controlling um, acid base balance. So you have a refractory acidosis. Why do we care if the patient is acidotic or not? I mean, if they're looking okay, why do we care? Because everything in the body is pH and temperature sensitive. Okay, remember, enzymes are very sensitive. So if pH or temperature is off whack, they don't work and everything in that is enzyme-based, okay? If you have a patient who has refractory fluid overload, okay, so their lungs are wet, pulmonary edema, serocytis, pericardial effusions, remember fluid can collect anywhere to the point where it is impairing their physiology. So they can't breathe, their cardiac function is abnormal, then you need to dialyze them to get fluid off. Okay, and those are actually the only things you're going to dialyze for. Okay, if the patient is not making urine, doesn't really matter. But if they have other manifestations of that, then it becomes an issue. Whether you see urine or not, doesn't really tell us about how the patient is. So, those are actually the only three things you're going to dialyze for. pH issues, refractory hyperkalemia, refractory fluid overload. Okay, so you see dialysis is actually not the, the answer that we hope it is. Okay, but if you have a patient who is continuously worsening, even if they don't have indications for dialysis at that point, you need to transfer them to a hospital that does have dialysis so if those indications become evident, they are already at their um, necessary unit. Okay. Ah, okie jokes. Okay. Um, again, the injury between interval and crush. Um, as soon as that muscle is injured and that gunk can get into the circulatory system, they have crush injury. Okay. Depending on what the muscle uh, the amount of muscle injured, that is how much um, they are going to manifest in terms of um, their hypovolemia, their electrolyte issues, their myoglobin load to the kidney. So, um, yeah, the, the time interval is, is not really relevant, but you are going to be more worried if the patient was beaten yesterday and you're only starting his fluids now, because it means there's been enough time for all of that stuff to circulate around and hurt the kidney without you getting your fluid in to dilute and try and mitigate that. Remember, you can't undo the myoglobin floating around, but you can dilute it. That is why we want to get fluid in as quickly as possible. Okay. Remember, it's not like burns. You don't want to play catch up with all the hours that you've lost. Treat the patient that is in front of you. Okay. So start the 250 then, you don't have to catch up the hours that they were lying in the field or trapped in the car. Okay. Um, so common arrhythmias, again, you can see any spectrum. Okay. But normally it's ventricular, ventricular dysrhythmias. So it can be fast, it can be slow, that's not really relevant, but it tends to be more broad complex. Okay. 
bearing in mind I am a surgeon, so I only have an idiot's understanding of dysrhythmias and the heart and that, but I try and keep it simple for myself. Um, it tends to be ventricular. Why? Because you have lots of potassium floating around, the membranes don't have their normal balance, so they are more easily triggered. Okay, and especially the, the ventricle, which has a large muscle bulk and therefore a large sensitivity to electrolyte and electropotential difference. So, um, and they are also ventricular dysrhythmias um, are the dysrhythmias that manifest um, clinical signs more. So they are hypotensive, they have chest pain, um, they have cardiac failure, okay, because your, ventric your ventricle is what um, makes everything happen in the heart. The atria are not very exciting, but the ventricle and ventricular dysrhythmias are, are a major problem. Okay. Um, also, remember that even though you get dysrhythmia drugs, okay, they are not going to be effective if you haven't managed the cause. What is the cause? Usually the potassium. Okay. So, are you just going to boom, get the potassium down? No, you are going to give your calcium first okay because that will begin to protect the cardiac muscle membranes before you get the potassium down so sometimes just by giving calcium you already start to treat your dysrhythmia okay so remember that um, for any dysrhythmia that you see what are the electrolytes what is the calcium okay calcium is very rarely if you give an extra dose not it's very rarely going to hurt the patient okay um all right that's just rhythmias mm. okay here's a very excellent and practical question in a patient with an injury that could cause crash so they fell from a building or okay let's say community assault because we see that often they don't have any symptoms how long are we going to monitor the patient in hospital and should one initiate therapy in any case. So I think for that, let's quickly take a step back and discuss how we diagnose crush. All right. So we said crush injury, we suspect that based on the mechanism of the injury. I actually created a little slide for you guys on this. Uh, okay, it's like I could predict, eh? Okay. So first of all, we think about the mechanism. Are we suspicious about it? Okay, because we all know what the lab system is like. You can take the bloods up yourself. Thank you, SIS, for running bloods up to the lab. We do appreciate it. Okay, you can take the bloods up yourself, and it is still going to take in a private lab at least an hour in government quickly, six to eight hours. Okay, so we don't want to wait six to eight hours before we initiate our um, primary treatment. Okay. So if you are suspicious, start the fluid, okay? If you see, geez, this patient is excreting four moles per kilogram per hour, then you know, okay, no, I can come down with my fluid, okay? You can go up with fluids, but remember, you can also come down with fluids. 250 is just, like I said, a thumb suck starting amount, okay? So titrate according to your urine output. Clinical picture, so here we can see on this guy, he's got a lot of bruising, okay? Does he have muscle weakness? Does he have muscle tenderness? Okay, what can we do by the bedside? We're going to put a catheter in and we're going to look at his urine. Okay, if we already have that tea, coke colored urine, we're already a little bit worried because it means that stuff has already hit the system and it's already in the kidney. But most of the time we will see that. Okay, how can we confirm? Okay, and why are we seeing this dark urine? Okay, it's because there is myoglobin in the urine and that causes that pigmentation all right how can we confirm that it's myoglobin and it's not just really dehydrated or something else that gives you a similar appearance you do a dipstick okay bearing in mind the dipstick is not saying yes there's myoglobin it is saying there is blood in the urine okay because it's not a very clever stick but we said that the molecular structure of hemoglobin and myoglobin is very similar. So that is what that dipstick is picking up. Okay. So it will be blood positive, but with our clinical picture, we're going, ah, that's myoglobin, not hemoglobin. Okay. 
So we are also going to do a ABG, okay, except that it is a good idea in any trauma patient to do this. What are we looking for? What, it, what is it going to immediately give us the result of? Okay, it's going to tell us what the pH is, which we said gives us an idea of what's happening with a kidney because pH is the kidney's job, okay? It's going to give us an immediate potassium level, which we may or may not need to react on, okay? And most um, blood gases will also give you a bicarb level, all right? So why is this important? Because if the bicarb level is low, we know, oh, there's already an acid-base issue and the kidney is not coping, all right? Because if there was an acid base issue and the patient's acidotic, bicarb being used, that's okay, the kidney is making more, okay? But if there is an acid base issue, the bicarb is dropping, it means the kidney is not able to keep up with the demand or it's injured, it's not able to do its job. So that is why it is important in a crush patient to look at the bicarb level. Because there have also been studies that correlate lower levels of bicarb with worse outcomes. So if you are seeing a patient that just arrived into your emergency department and his bicarb is already less than 20, this patient has a very light, high likelihood of requiring dialysis. Okay, so when you refer, it again gives you ammunition to sell your patient and go, he's okay now and I am resuscitating him, but he came in with a bicarb of 90. Okay, then any referring doctor should be awake enough if he's from Stellenbosch to realize that, okay, this patient needs to come over to my hospital. Okay, but you understand why you are seeing that on the blood gas based on the pathophys. Okay, and then if we want to for sure confirm it, we do a CK and a myoglobin. Okay, both molecules that live in the cell. Okay, the myoglobin is the one that hurts the kidney, okay? At Tigerberg, we test CKs, okay? Why do we do that? If we have a CK positive, it means there's muscle injury, okay? So it's a bit of a cheaper test, it's more easily available. And if you look at how long the myoglobin lasts in the blood and how long the CK lasts in the blood, we are more likely to get a positive CK value, okay? Of course, again, here comes in with when was the patient injured and when are we testing, but we very seldomly get a patient from the scene in less than two hours or from the injury in less than two hours. So yes, we can test the myoglobin, but it is a more expensive test and not every lab does it. So you are perfectly within reason to do a CK level, as a marker of cell, in, cell injury and myoglobin. Um, whether you confirm myoglobin or not is irrelevant, okay? We want to confirm um, muscle cell license and we can do that with the CK. So you see the CK lasts a bit longer, um, but it also peaks with the, the myoglobin. So we test CK. Um, there is no real indication to do serial testing, okay? because the value that you get on the CK is irrelevant, okay? Above 3,000 is a confirmed crush injury. This is the CK level, okay? So above 3,000, confirmed crush injury. Remember, it's only a crush syndrome if we see potassium issues, ECG issues, renal issues. Otherwise, you don't qualify to be called a syndrome. You only have a crush injury, okay? Um, what was I saying? Oh, you don't need to do serial CK values because regardless of what the number is, we are going to treat the clinical picture, okay? The higher the CK value does not necessarily correlate to the worse the patient does, okay? So you can come in with a CK of 9,000 and no renal impairment. You can come in with a CK of 2,000 and be in a vert failure, okay? It is just an indicator of muscle injury. It is not really telling you how the patient is going to do long term. Okay. Um, but regardless of that, based on your clinical suspicion and your urine output, you're going to start your fluid. Okay. So if your patient has a crush injury, 
you are going to do serial UKEs and monitor them for at least 24 hours to make sure that you don't have the patient progressing towards the crush syndrome. Okay. If you have two normal UNEs, 24 hours apart, then we discharge you and we say, okay, we got you through the work. Because remember, you don't have ongoing intracellular leak. You have the injury, the stuff leaks out, you have issues, okay? So that is also why we don't do um, serial CKs because we don't expect it to be going up, okay? And even if it's coming down, that doesn't really tell us anything. We're going on the clinical picture that the patient is showing us in terms of their potassium levels, gases, um, Okay, that answers that one. Okay. Okay, no, good question here. Um, would administering insulin, which causes potassium uptake intracellularly, like we said, not affect the, the cardiomyocyte. Um, it creates a period of sensitivity. Okay, when you have electrolytes moving in any direction, it creates a period of sensitivity. So that is why we give the calcium before we shift the patient so that we um, kind of make that sensitivity less so that while the shift is happening, we don't have dysrhythmias being triggered. So that is a very good question. Okay, so important to give your calcium before you give your potassium shift. Remember, the calcium doesn't shift it. It just stabilizes the membrane while things are shifting. All right, and that is with every shift. So if the patient needs a shift every hour, they are going to get calcium every hour. All right. All righty, any other questions? Okay, is there anything else you guys want to know at this point? Um, anybody interested in one slide on compartment syndrome or do you want to do that as a different talk? Nods, yes, I have one nod, two nod, two nod, let me just see other people. Okay, are we going to, it's been a long talk already, but I think let's do a, I have I think one slide on compartment syndrome, okay? So if we just think about our definition of compartment syndrome, it's where you have a closed compartment where the pressure in that closed compartment is increasing, okay? And why is that an issue? Because it affects the perfusion. Remember, blood vessels run into and out of a compartment, all right? So they are kind of visitors traveling through that compartment. And in, if the pressure is so high, it closes those blood vessels. So it's not that there's immediate cell lysis, it's that there's um, compromise of the cell membrane because it's not getting energy, which then causes lysis. Okay, so I actually just want to go back to this picture. Uh, okay, so we've said that on this picture, the diffusion of energy and oxygen happens at a capillary level. Okay, so Let's think about what is the pressure in the arterial system, more or less. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in, in uh, I want a show of fingers. So option one is 80 millimeters mercury. Option two is 120 millimeters mercury. And option three is 25 millimeters mercury. Okay, let's see anybody else. Okay, good. All right, so remember, the pressure in the arterial system is your systolic blood pressure. So about average patient, let's say 120. Okay, so what is the pressure in the venous system? Is it 80, 120, 25? Option one, two, or three? Okay, it's about 80, your diastolic blood pressure. Okay, so now remember the capillaries are thin walled. Okay, they're kind of bridging between the two. Um, they absorb a lot of the pressure because obviously there's a pressure drop between the arterial and the venous system. Remember, they're a fine meshwork. So they're very thin, but there's a lot of them. Okay, 
So what is the pressure in the capillary system? Is it? There we go, yes. Is it 80, 120, or 25? Okay, good, yes, it's 25. Okay, it's low pressure, okay. Because you want things to be able to diffuse out and diffuse in, okay. So you want a low pressure. Remember what maintains part of that um, balance between things going in and out? That's your oncotic pressure your proteins and stuff that attract fluid in and out. All right. Um, what did I say? Okay, right. So now you have a leg. All right. So you have this picture in the background of your mind. So now we go to our leg. I'm getting to it. All right. So if you zoom in, that is what a normal leg looks like. And then you have the bottom leg where there's been a fracture or I rode over your leg or I beat your leg with a shambok and you have either bleeding, which takes up space and causes increased pressure, or you have cell lysis with fluid being sequestrated there and the muscles swelling up, okay, causing increased pressure. Because the whole thing about a compartment syndrome, it must be a contained compartment. There's no stretch there, okay. So after... Um, we've discussed this, we're going to think about where you get compartment, okay? But there's not room for stretch. That's why compartment syndrome can happen, okay? So with those three, because there are three types of um, vasculature, okay, running into the compartment, which vasculature is going to be compressed first, okay? The lowest pressure one, which we said is our capillary system. Okay, but the arterial system is not compressed. The venous system is not compressed. Okay, but is perfusion of that limb affected? Yes, because the level where it gets all its nutrients is on the capillary level, and that is affected first. Are you still going to have a pulse in that leg? Yes, because your artery is not yet compressed. Are you going to have congested veins? No, because the veins are not yet compressed, okay? But already at that point, perfusion is affected to that limb, okay? So now you have an unhappy limb. There's um, already ischemia happening on a cellular level. So it gets angrier, angrier, angrier. The pressure builds up, okay? What is the next tube that is going to be affected? The venous system. Okay, because that has the next lowest pressure. So at that point, you may have impaired venous return. Um, you can have superficial venous congestion. Okay, will you still have a pulse in that foot? Yes, because the artery is not yet compressed. Blood is not properly getting in because it's a high pressure system, but you will still have pulsation along that tube. So people saying, oh, but it can't be compartment, it has a pulse. You see why that is flawed thinking. Because already before you lose your pulse, on a microcellular level, you have ischemia of that tissue. Okay. And only much later, when it's very high pressure, do you actually get compression of the artery and you lose your pulse. But by then, the tissue is way ischemic already and probably dead. Okay. So if we go through our diagnosis of compartment syndrome it is a clinical diagnosis okay first of all based on suspicion okay so does this patient have soft tissue trauma does this patient have fractures okay do they have a tight constricting band on do they have a vascular injury okay um that that could cause compartment syndrome and then the two most sensitive things for compartment syndrome is two Ps, okay? Pain out of proportion, okay? So what I'm saying is this patient doesn't have a broken leg, but he is screaming that his leg is aching, okay? Or he has a broken leg, but you've splinted it, you've given him adequate analgesia, and he is still screaming of pain, okay? That is pain out of proportion, all right? And then the next most sensitive thing is 
pain on passive stretch. This isn't, if I've got a broken arm, you wiggling my wrist. That is going to hurt, I've got a broken arm. But it's distal to the injury, you just flexing and extending a finger or a toe, okay? And that causes major, major pain for the patient. They are not going to want to or be able to flex and extend on them, uh, by themselves, but passive, which means you are doing the motion, will cause severe pain. Why? Because you are increasing the energy requirement in that muscle and they are already in an energy deficit. Okay. The pain they are experiencing is ischemic pain. That is why it is so incredibly severe and not relieved um, with the analgesia that we give. So those two things are your most sensitive um, clinical findings. The six Ps that we talk about in vascular is great if you want to diagnose a dead limb. Okay, so do not wait for those six Ps to be evident. Okay, that is a dead limb. All right, so not of value in a compartment syndrome. Then as you can see in that picture as well, um, it is swollen, it is tense. Okay, so if you actually feel the muscle compartment, they're tender and swollen. Okay, because there's fluid in there, the muscle is ischemic, there's cell lysis happening. So um, that is why you, you see that clinical picture. Okay, so let's just think about how a crush injury can cause a compartment syndrome. So there the muscle cells are injured. Okay, they break open and there's edema. Okay, where there's injury, the body sends cells, those cells draw fluid. So then that fluid causes an increase in pressure and that can cause a compartment syndrome. Okay, so now let's think in reverse how compartment syndrome can cause a crush. Okay, so say you broke your leg, there's a lot of edema, um, not necessarily a lot of soft tissue injury, okay, but there's a lot of edema, you have a compartment syndrome, okay. So now the cells that were not injured are becoming ischemic because of the edema and the compartment syndrome. So because of the ischemia, they cannot maintain their cell membrane and then they lie. Okay, but are you going to have crush manifestations while your compartment syndrome is ongoing? No, very good. Okay, because it's nicely trapped in that compartment. We said the venous system, which takes all of the gunk into the body, is also compressed at a point. Okay, so when are you going to have your crush manifestation? When you open that compartment up. Okay, all right, then. So you're actually going to say to your anesthetist, okay, I'm opening up the compartment or I'm fixing the artery or whatever watch your ECG because that is when all of that um, toxin, gunk, cellular stuff is going to hit the system, okay, when you release those compartments, okay, and take the, the pressure off, okay. And what is another name for that? Excellent. I saw you say it there in the corner. Okay, that is reperfusion syndrome, okay. And now you learned a whole nother syndrome for free because it's basically crush, okay? It's just how you get to reperfusion that changes a little bit, okay? So, yay, bonus marks and you didn't even have to study anything extra, okay? So how do we manage compartment syndrome? Okay, obviously what you guys can do, adequate resuscitation, manage the cause of the compartment syndrome. So if it's a cast or a broken leg, you splint it, keep it as still as possible, adequate hydration, adequate analgesia, okay? But definitively, they need a fasciotomy, okay? If um, it is a compartment syndrome caused by the fascia, if it's not, a, remember, a cast, a tight bandage can also cause a compartment syndrome. So anything that creates a closed environment, all right, but a fasciotomy. Fasciotomies, need to be done in a theater, okay, by a surgeon or a person with experience, okay. Yes, you may have to do it in an emergency, then I would advise you just quickly Google it beforehand because there are actual specific anatomic landmarks, okay. And don't worry, I also frequently have to 
refresh the exact anatomy and landmark of it because it's not something we do often. So don't feel bad if you can't remember it. As long as you have Google access, keep important things in your brain. Don't memorize things that you can Google. All right. So that's what a fasciotomy looks like. Okay. So bearing in mind, in the arm it will be different, in the lower leg it will be different, in the thigh it will be different, depending on how the compartments are formed, which fascia you need to open. Okay. So again, but that needs to happen in theater because it's painful and it bleeds. All right, so that needs to happen with, with proper anesthesia. And as soon as you open those compartments, you're going to warn your anesthetic colleague, okay, um, you know, watch for reperfusion because they can um, sometimes immediately see mm -hmm. cardiac dysrhythmia at, at that capacity. Okay, dokes. Um, okay, here's another good question which compartment in the leg is most likely? So, Normally, you lose your anterior compartment first. Okay, that is just because um, of the way the arterial supply is, but that is your most sensitive compartment um, to compartment syndrome. Um, that's of the lower leg. Okay, the, the thigh in that um, is usually quite equally injured. Um, and in terms of the forearm, you lose your flexor compartment first. So you get those false, false mode contractures where they get a little claw hand. That is because they get um, ischemia in their um, flexor compartment. Okay, here's another good question. How would you evaluate clinical findings in a patient with a spinal level or that's paralyzed or unconscious? That is a very good question. So like we mentioned, compartment syndrome is a clinical diagnosis. So those patients are at very high risk of having missed um, diagnoses of compartment syndrome. But what we do then is we identify any fractures, we splint those fractures, and we palpate those compartments regularly every four to six hours. Um, it's not foolproof. There are actual um, clinical, I don't want to say clinical, um, quantitative monitors that one can use where you put a needle into the compartment. But those are not well clinically validated. And again, you know, the pressure we're seeing, how does that relate to the blood pressure and perfusion pressure? So actually, even in tertiary centers, we just use um, clinical examination. Does the compartment feel tense? What is the capillary reflow like? Okay, it's not foolproof. We need to recognize that but that is what we have available at the time. And normally if the patient is unconscious or there is, um, you know, if they are paralyzed, there are larger issues that we are worried about at that point. Um, so these are often missed injuries. But again, just to be aware and think, oh, have I checked for compartment syndrome in that polytrauma patient is, is always a good idea. That's an excellent question. Okay, let's see. Anything else? Sure, we've covered quite a lot now. I hope I haven't mentally fatigued you guys too much. Um, if there's anything else, please contact SAS. Thank you very much to them for giving us this platform. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, we are going to make the recording available. Um, keep an eye on, on the SAS um, platforms for that. You don't really need the PowerPoint. Everything um, is on Sunday under the crush tutorial. So we maybe went through a bit of extra detail here, but that's just for you guys. Thank you very much for giving up your Saturday. I hope you enjoyed it. I appreciated your interaction and facial expressions. It really makes the job a lot more fun. Um, Shade and Sas, thank you guys very much for um, hosting. Anything else you want to say to the team? No, there's nothing else from my side. We only want to thank you, Dr. Chanel, for giving us the tutorial. Um, we've really been starved of clinical um, knowledge and experience. So thank you so much for good giving thought. up your time. Good thought. Okay, thanks, guys. Have a good Saturday. Bye-bye.